Welcome to the Long Range Pursuit Podcast, presented by Gunworks, where we learn about and share long-range shooting techniques, science, and gear. All right, welcome back to another episode of Long Range Pursuit Podcast. This is uh, Instructor's Corner Edition, and uh, we've got kind of a hot topic today, maybe not the most exciting <laughs> topic in the world, but I think it's heavily debated and we get the question a lot. So we wanted to talk about cleaning your rifle, when to clean your rifle, if you should clean your rifle, how to clean your rifle. We get all the questions yeah. and we've got all the experts here in the room. So yeah, I don't know if anybody's cleaned a rifle more than me. Probably I've, not. I doubt it. Ten I a bet, day for, I bet nobody for the last like, seven years in the world <laughs> yeah, has the world cleaned a rifle as much as Jerry. <laughs> yeah. So there's probably not anybody that hates cleaning rifles <laughs> well, more than you do. Yeah. But there probably aren't even factories that clean rifles, right? No, no, no. They just they no. send you out to yeah. yeah. They shoot so, your group and you get the rifle. You've cleaned your but, fair uh, share of rifles. Yeah, yeah, I have. I was just thinking about that. You know, there's a when we approach this topic, you know, we're kind of looking for you know, and I spent most of my life in the world of either the Marine Corps sniper community or law enforcement sniper community. Yeah. And I spent so many years of my life trying to figure out how can I clean this bore just because I think I'm supposed to clean it and still get a good cold bore shot from a clean barrel, you know, because that cold bore shot was so important. You know, so I've, I've literally logged thousands, you know, between working at sniper school and then in law enforcement, thousands of cold bore shots over the years, you know, and the end result of all that experience and all that gnashing of teeth and wringing of hands trying to figure out how to clean a rifle so it gives a good cold bore shot has kind of come to the conclusion of never try don't to clean it. But we're not saying take a cold bore shot. But then yeah. having said that, it's obvious the rifle needs to be cleaned at some point in time. You know, and there's kind of some competing schools of thought on that. And, you know, if I go back to, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps sniper program, um, you know, we were kind of heavily influenced by like the bench rest shooting community then. You know, and in that period of time, the bench rest community, shooting community thought that if you shoot 30 rounds through a rifle, you know, you better clean it. You know, so our cleaning procedures at the time were kind of based on that. And now if you look at what, you know, what's popular in the PRS world now, you know, their solution is put that gun in the safe. And when it yells at me, it needs to be cleaned, then we're going to clean it. You know, and then the, you know, it begs the question is like, well, how does a gun tell you it needs to be cleaned? Yeah. You know, and I think um, if you look at what PRS is doing where they burn 30 grains of powder every shot versus 80 or 100 grains, you know, with some of your hunting calibers, you know, there's a, there's a difference. And I also think suppressors added a complete kind of a fundamental change sure. in how barrels behave as they get dirty. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it really increases the rate at which they foul. Right. You know, so having said all that, I think we can all agree the truth probably lies in the middle somewhere. And that's kind of, kind of our philosophy. But, you know, I think uh, Jeremy is by far the expert on how fouling builds up in barrels, you know, what causes it and at what point in time does it start to, you know, cause you issues? Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's a good place we need to start to define. It's like, what are those issues that we're going to see, right? Like there's the major ones, right? Mm -hmm. We start to see pressure. I consider those major because we should have seen a few more before that, right? So by the time your bolt gets pretty stiff to lift and you're seeing smiley faces on the back of your brass, I think we're beyond where we should have been mm -hmm. and noticed it. Um, a root, you know, where we tend to run some pretty serious data downrange, you know, we're tied to these, uh, you know, these yardage turrets, BDC turrets, you know, when you dial to 650 and you're half and you're hitting high consistently, that's a good indicator that something has boosted our velocity. And so if I'm running the same lot of ammo and apples to apples on everything else, that's a good indicator that, um, I'm starting to get into a fouled condition. So we should be able to find something beforehand before we get to the you know, the oh crap situation of, you know, am I locking my bolt shut to, you know, kind of on the dangerous side to figure out, you know, where, you know, watching that data, maybe, um, your, your zero to hundred climbs a little, you, you could see it if you had, you know, a really accurate rifle and you could shoot some serious groups at a hundred, you'd see that, you'd see that uh, group change point of impact down there uh, with some fouling. But I think the, the easiest thing for us is, is that data on the turret, you mm -hmm. know, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't take, you know, at 800 yards with a little Creedmoor, what does it take? Like 25, 30 feet per second increase. And we're, we're talking quarter to half a minute high already, a couple of clicks, you know, and so the, the guns shoot well enough that we can see that, you know, at distance. Right. And so a really quick little, you know, look over on the rifle to make sure we don't have anything loose. And, uh, you know, our zero was solid and that's a prime indicator that we've gained some velocity somewhere. And so if my ammunition's the same, that leads me right back to, it has to be a fouling issue. 
you know, yeah. we're, we're necking down the bore enough to start to increase velocity. So, so there are some indicators there. Um, you know, I, I'd encourage guys to try to catch them earlier than, you know, the bolt lift and the, those, the smiley faces. Cause at that point, I think we're beyond where we should be for sure, you know, right. on that cleaning process. Cause it'll be even harder to get it to return back to, you know, a shootable bore, yeah. right. You know, consistent. Right. Yeah, you know, watching the school guns, you know, we kind of see it where when I can first tell there's an issue with a gun, you know, and sometimes you have to try to be able to remove the shooter from the equation, you know, as you'll see the occasional high shot at 600 or 800 yards. And you always got to look at parallax and look at some other things that can cause high shots, you know, not loading the bipod and stuff or a soft rear bag. But once you eliminate those, you're still getting that occasional high, high shot. And those high shots will just get more and more frequent until it's literally like the bulk of the rounds are high. You know, and if you've mm -hmm. been running a chronograph on that gun, you know, during that process, you probably would have saw that the extreme spreads, you know, went from maybe 20 or 30 feet per second to 60 feet per second mm -hmm. as that barrel got too So it's fouled. an indicator that it's pressuring up. Yeah. And, you know, you get some inconsistencies you know, and in then, how it pressures up yeah. when, when it's doing that. And then at some point yeah. after that, you'll get the stiff bolt lift. You'll okay. get the smiley backing on your case from the brass flowing back into the um, ejector cutouts. And then at some point after that, you'll actually start blowing primers mm -hmm. you know which which believe it or not we actually see i wouldn't say it's common but it's not uncommon at lru you know to where you know when you're putting thousands and yeah, thousands, putting of thousands of these rounds that didn't get cleaned right yeah. you know like that gun got missed in the last class evolution or whatever and someone's shooting and all of a sudden they're like yeah i got stiff bolt lift yeah you know and you're like on the last day you know and you're trying to you're trying to make it to the finish line yeah you right. know with that gun and sure enough you know 20 yeah. rounds later you know, a primer pops out the back. I mean, that's, we've definitely gone too far. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you guys see? I, I think the, the, our LRU guns are a perfect test bed for that. So what do you typically see as, as your, or what has become the kind of standard approach to cleaning when you're shooting those rifles on a regular basis with high round counts? You know, I think with the, with the six, five Creedmoors, you know, if you look at our, our pace, those rifles get cleaned about every 200 rounds in school. Okay. And with the 6.5 Creep more suppressed, that's not sufficient, mm -hmm. you know, because we have carbon rings build up in those over the period of a couple of classes. Yeah. Now, I venture to say, just based on, you know, my history of shooting 308s a lot, you know, with a, burning a similar amount of powder, although in a bigger barrel, is that if they weren't suppressed, I think we'd be okay with that 200 mm -hmm. yard, 200 round count in between cleanings. Yeah. But suppressed, I think you have to cut that in half. Mm -hmm. And then if you up it to like your, you know, the actual hunting cartridges, you know, I know, for example, with my personal 30 nozzler, if um, if I get above about 60 rounds, I'll start seeing my extreme spreads, you know, 60 to 80, my extreme spreads will start increasing. You know, so that tells me that, and that's suppressed. So that's telling me that carbon ring's probably building up in there. Yeah. You know, unsuppressed, I could probably get a little more. But if I was just to have to put a number on it, I think, uh, you know, for recommendation for the hunting calibers, you know, probably in that, you know, 60 round mark is probably a good time to clean. And maybe the smaller capacity cases like your Creedmoors and stuff, you might get away with 100. But mm -hmm. that's, I don't know, that's, that might be pushing it. No, that's a good, that's a good solid number. You know, that we've seen that, you know, in, you know, many of the calibers. Some tend to be like the 6.5s, like I mentioned earlier, tend to be a little more sensitive. You know, the big 30s, they've mm -hmm. always been pretty easy on the, on the fouling for some reason, whatever it is. You know, I haven't looked into it that much, but uh, that's probably a good number for just kind of across the board. Yeah. You know, PRC, 7 SOM, 7 LRM, whatever you're shooting. Um, that should give you a, at least a solid benchmark. You know, you're, you're two weeks away from hunting season and you're at round 55 and you're not seeing any signs of pressure. Well, there's your number 60. You, it's time to let's get that gun clean so that you have no, no funniness through the hunting season. So sure. at least it gives you a good, you know, a good number. Um, also a good, good reason to be keeping track of round count. Right. Not a lot yep. of guys do. Um, it's something that I do pretty religiously now yeah. <clears throat> for that, just for yep. the cleaning purposes, you know, so, you know, keep track of the rounds and, you know, and then, uh, you'll know exactly when you do and don't need to clean that rifle. So I know we've got, got a lot of guys listening, thinking I never shoot my rifles and or I never clean my rifles and they shoot half minute, you know, the, the entire life of the barrel, essentially. Um, a lot of different schools of thought there, but w where do you think the, the difference is there? I mean, obviously different opinions and different approaches and maybe different styles of shooting and different, different yeah. rifles, but I think it's the amount of powder you're burning, mm -hmm. you know, and most people that burn 80 or hundred grains of powder per shot 
don't shoot that much. Yeah. You know, so the round count never gets up there with a 6.5 Creedmoor. Right. And then I think adding the suppressor to the mix, you know, because if you look at what happens inside, you know, a semi-auto and AR platform, mm -hmm. when you run a suppressor on it, if it's a direct impingement, there is so much carbon back in that system. Oh, yeah. Well, you think about, and that's because, you know, the gas tube is letting that carbon get back in the system. Well, you think about a bolt gun where there is no gas tube, that carbon's just being trapped in the barrel. Yeah. And so I really think the issues that we see with carbon rings building up, you know, they increase your velocity, increase your pressure. I think they're directly related to suppressors, or at least suppressors yeah. really aggravate that. You know, you know, I'm I'm sure there's some involved there with um, case design. You know, a certain case might just be more prone to carbon rings. Probably the types of powder you're burning yeah. too. Uh, you know, I know some powders are far more dirty than other than yeah. others. So there's a lot of different variables there. Yeah, yeah. you know the you know the case neck uh, shoulder juncture area. Uh, you know that dictates where the fire you know comes out of the case and exactly. hits the throat at the, the angle it's coming. Across. Yeah, we're yeah. lucky nowadays. You know most everything nowadays is Deep what shoulders. you would consider Ackley improved. Yep. You know that you know your more traditional mm -hmm. 270 and 30 out six and 243s and 25 out six. They had a real narrow shoulder angle, mm -hmm. and so that allowed what essentially that did is that put that fire right into that throat area and that's why they had you know fouling problems and low round counts you know yeah. you know if they were hard on you know 243 was always Burned known to be barrels. hard on barrels yeah. you know that's why but nowadays we're pretty i mean we are pretty lucky we get all these great cartridges very efficient yeah. um and I, I think you know because of that we're seeing much higher round counts and not needing yeah. to clean uh, because of that you know just just that simple design feature up front so I mean, I'm sure that play has a lot to do with it. Yeah. You, know? Uh, you know, before we hit record here, we were talking about, I mean, you've got guys from vast ends of the spectrum, everything from burning a, out a barrel in a summer to, you know, maybe putting 10 rounds through a rifle, a hunting rifle in a, in a year. And I think there's obviously a vast difference probably on how often you're shooting and how often you're making tweaks to your ballistics. You know, a guy that's out shooting, every day or every other day of the week is probably keeping very close tabs on minute changes mm -hmm. in, in his, how his barrel shooting over the course of that and making changes as, as needed to, to accommodate that. Uh, whereas, you know, your, your layman that's maybe shooting a box or a couple, couple boxes, uh, a year, basically go outside in the rifle, maybe put a couple rounds through the summer and then go hunting in the fall. It's like, you, yeah, I think you that need to, maintain consistency across those short yeah i think that's um, why having just a number right yeah. it's like you hit this number let, you let's get it, it cleaned yeah. right uh, you know that that eliminates the need for the guy to you know maybe as put as many rounds down range as i had and can actually kind of sense and feel how that gun's re you know reacting yeah. group wise and you know can see that that level before it gets to the pressure signs mm. you know you know you guy that's just shooting a box every year it's not number one they're not going to shoot enough i don't think to see that yeah um you know in any kind of time frame you know and then uh yeah and the, so it's nice to just have a number you know yeah. 60 and clean okay, your rifle clean. and then you know after that point just get a few foul rounds down it and we're ready to roll for another year or two depending on you yeah know, how many rounds you shoot during the hunting season and i hope it goes without saying but just to be clear we don't ever want to be going and on a hunt with a clean bore, right? Um, your rifle's not no, going to shoot the no, same on a clean no. bore. So you uh, always want to be hunting on a felled, yeah, on a felled bore. Yeah, because you don't. Yeah, there's only one clean pulled bore or one clean shot, right? And, and it's then always different. Yeah, yeah like it's so, amazing how different that first yeah, shot. Yeah, like after Brian was saying, is. all that data he's collected, and you yeah. know, he, he never found that perfect little sweet clean cold yeah. spot. Yeah. You know, it's so hard to get to. But we know that if we just get some fowler rounds yeah. down it, you know, three to five. Yeah what i would recommend and you get some fowlers down it we know that we can that's pretty repeatable yep. at that point yep. and so yeah we never want to go clean you know about the only caveat to that i'd say is if you know folks are hunting with obviously not our rifles but something off the shelf with a chrome holly barrel yeah you know and they're hunting in like say kodiak or a, a place point. that has a lot of salt you gotta have air barrel you know, oiled carbon attracts moisture you know mm -hmm. and you can rust a barrel up really quick you know, and I'm not yeah. saying stainless steel won't rust, it will, but it's much more resistant to it. Yeah. You know, so I'd be cautious with the guys that have chrome Ollie barrels, you know, on following that advice of that is a good point. You know, hunting with a dirty barrel, you know, depending on the environment you're in. Sure. Sure. I'm also thinking taking a step back too, and you're talking about the guy who shoots two boxes of ammo through his rifle a year kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And coming from the Midwest, like 
that's what it was. Yeah. And it was a 30 out six or a 270 or a 30 30 or something like that. And it was, you're shooting at 200 yards at max, maybe 300. Yeah. And I don't think that's the distance enough to see that there's these symptoms happening either. You don't, I mean, maybe you get that stiff bolt lift or something to like, you're talking about the extremes, but you're not seeing the, oh, I'm a half minute high. Yeah. They don't even know what that is. You know, right. it's like, I'm doing a holdover. I must've held a little it's higher on that one, you know? Yeah. So I think a lot of it is that too. It's, it's the guys who are really kind of getting serious and digging in deep that are going to actually notice, notice these things. the differences. Yeah. 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 No doubt. I mean, at the end of the day, if you spend, you know, a lot of money on a good rifle system, you know, that's kind of money wasted if you're not doing everything you can to get the most performance out of it you can. Mm-hmm. You know, because if you're not taking the steps to get the most performance out of it, you could, you might as well have just bought something off the shelf because yeah. that's essentially what you have. Sure. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Which it's funny. There's serious whitetail hunters in Nebraska, like serious. And they've got, you know, walls are caked full of these whitetail. I bet 90% of them have cleaned their rifle like twice because <laughs> yeah. it's just they're shooting them from that close but I, mean, I totally agree with you yeah but it's guys they're like oh yeah i've never cleaned that thing it's yeah. shooting great you know yeah. and yeah. it's because they don't they don't know well you know if it's if it's like you said if it's paper plate at 200 yards yeah yeah really probably doesn't matter much it's shooting great honest, it goes bang every time i pull the yeah. trigger you know? <laughs> that's different perspectives and different yeah. styles of hunting and yeah yeah you know sometimes you don't need what you don't need but um same same point sometimes some of us like to yeah. <laughs> yeah. like to have a well well oiled fine tuned or, or they just rag. don't know what is happening because sure. it's not showing obvious signs right. that's uh, you know yeah i mean i think it's probably a good point to you know talk about what actually happens inside the barrel you know as we fire some rounds and how that you know how that fouling builds up so you know i defer it back to jeremy as being the kind of duty <laughs> expert on that <laughs> internal ballistics lesson here yeah Yeah, well well, i mean what we always traditionally see is you know every every barrel you know every quality barrel i should say tapers from the chamber down to the muzzle so it gets tighter and tighter as it goes down they lap that in there on purpose um and and so uh predominantly what you'll see unless you have a bad spot in the barrel somewhere you will see the copper build on the muzzle end and then you see your carbon build on the chamber end and that's because that's where all the heat and the pressure forms you know as that bullet <clears throat> as your cartridge goes off the case expands you know the powder's going off and the case expands to the the dimension of the chamber and then pressure builds and overcomes the neck tension and then once neck tension overcomes then the bullet leaps forward and when it leaps forward it actually stops in the rifling until pressure builds again that will overcome the swedge through the rifling case okay? so, those, those time frames are s- s- infinitely small, but because you've got this stop and start, you got a greater friction in that spot. It creates more heat in that, uh, in that lead area. And so that's where you create this. It's essentially a glaze of carbon built right there. Um, and that's where we, you know, we come, we'll, we'll digress to the carbon ring later, but you know, that's where that, that carbon, that first two to three inches of your, of your chamber right into the rifling there. It's where your carbon generally generally builds, and so you you know most most barrels they're fairly clean in the middle when it actually comes down to it. You know they tend to foul out on the copper on the muzzle end and carbon on the other end, but the middle stays fairly clean unless, like I said, there's a spot in there. So usually you know you're cleaning one end or the other really. You know and and unless you have some you know some weirdness in there somewhere you know a rough spot that's grabbing copper early or you know or or you've had a severe neglect of carbon and it's crept you know you've got carbon clear down the bore that's causing problems which we see i think we see we have a we have a cutout barrel that we show the the students in our class and you can see that that one has carbon four or five six inches down the bore you know because it hasn't been you know it wasn't cleaned well enough um back in the day but then you get down to the muzzle end and it's nice and shiny you know, you can see that that carbon hadn't been deposited down there. Obviously, the the copper was cleaned out of it, so you could see it. But uh, um, so, yeah, the carbon tends to build early, and then, but it tends to be the most stubborn one to get out as well on that on that in that process. We've got some pretty good copper solvents out there. There's lots. We use the KG products because they're water based, not as harmful to you, but uh, uh, and they work really good on the copper. But you know, in my opinion, in the across the industry, our carbon solvents kind of lag. 
Carbon, in, carbon is just, I mean, it, it's generally speaking a very um, inert, right? It just, yeah. it's not reactive with yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's not so, very reactive. So yeah. it's, you know, uh, copper, it's really easy to, you know, you put ammonia on it and it's going to, it's going to oxidize, yep. right? Oxidized, you, I don't know what they're using in the KG products, but whatever it is, that stuff kills copper amazingly well, yeah. right? But for whatever reason, carbon is just very, very difficult to dissolve and to remove once it's yeah. built yeah, up. Yeah, it's hard. You know, it yeah. doesn't dissolve well. And so it tends to be, it tends to be the one that I think it's gets the, us in trouble Yeah, because we don't, we don't tend to clean enough there. So you know, we, we'll get into, you know, the process here in a little bit, I'm sure. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I tend to think most of us don't clean carbon enough. And, and, and I that's guess, where I'll run into the problems. You know, we were having this discussion earlier, but um, I guess it is important to differentiate, you know, the, the black crud that the loose stuff in the barrel that you traditionally experience, you push a, a wet patch mm -hmm. through a bore, you get all this black stuff on there. Um, yes, that is carbon, but we're, what we're talking about is actual carbon deposits, like yeah. a, a built up hard product that is adhered to the bore of the rifle, a little bit of a different, different animal. Yeah. Yeah, for right. sure. You know, we can use a brush or just a patch, a wet patch, and we can get the, the particles out that, uh, without, you know, once a carbon ring or, you know, even a good layer of carbon's built in there, you know, you need an abrasive. Yeah. to actually break carbon out. Sure. So, you know, and that's part of our process, you know, to make sure these guns run, run well is, is that abrasive step. So, yeah. Well, should we uh, dive into the uh, cleaning process? A lot of different ways to clean. Everybody's got their own way. You know, I think we've got a relatively standardized way that's worked very well for us. And I'm sure everybody might take that and, and make their little own tweaks and modifications to it. But, um, you know, ha having these rifles that we're shooting, literally thousands and thousands of rounds through in relatively short order in the shooting school has given yeah. us some pretty good experience on figuring out what works and what yeah, doesn't. Some really good data. I mean, yeah. we, we have data daily, essentially, you know, yeah, yeah, for absolutely. years and years and years, you know, we've, we've been, you know, tracking this stuff. So, yeah. yeah, I think the biggest things that's changed over the last couple of years is the addition of suppressors, mm -hmm. you know, that have kind of changed, you know, the, the recent changes have all been, I think, based on the suppressors, yeah. you know, causing that carbon ring to build up a little bit quicker than we anticipated. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, with that, uh, someone want to jump into it? Ian. <laughs> get, get, get I think it. Ian, right? Ian's Nose got goes, down. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, first thing I'd say is that there's uh, well, a thousand ways to skin a cat kind of deal. So there's, there's so many ways to clean. Um, this is the way that we have found to be pretty successful. And how we teach at LRU is we're not trying to clean this barrel down to, uh, you know, it's, a brand new a brand new barrel new yeah we're, we're we're trying to keep it seasoned we like seasoned barrel we don't want a fouled barrel if you break it down into being that uh detailed you know fouling is when it it's it's fouled is when it's so dirty that it is impacting your point a and point impact uh seasoned is basically your barrels broke in and it has a little bit of dirtiness to it it's a nice way of saying mm -hmm. it's dirty um so how we clean it, this, this way I'm about to say is this is to clean it the least amount, but, uh, able to perform, you know, I don't know. How, Less how do you invasive, say that? I would say, right. I mean, you don't, you can't over clean a, a, a barrel and if it's done improperly, you can damage your barrel. And so, yeah. you know, there, there is, there are other opposite ends of the spectrum there i guess right? yeah you can over clean and you can under clean yeah i mean it's, it's cleaning and enough to keep that barrel from acting like a feral barrel sure but yet not eliminating the seasoning that helps that barrel shoot good sure there you go it's that it's kind of finding that happy medium yeah so we start off with carbon and we're using that the tipped in carbon fiber rods and and, uh, I, and I guess to even back up there maybe yeah. not to cut you off but um we always clean with a board guide Right. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, caliber specific bore guide. It's got a little O ring on it yeah. and, uh, it helps n not only keep the solvents out of the chamber or out of the, you know, trigger housing and back into the magazine well and mm -hmm. all that. It's also, um, guiding everything straight down the bore. I mean, imagine you're taking a steel rod or we like to use a carbon rod, yeah. but not everybody has one, even a carbon rod. Um, the most sensitive part of your rifle is essentially that, um, that lead and that, um, Actually, that chamber area and, but, the, right. crown. and the crown, and the crown. <laughs> well obviously yeah. the crown but yeah. yeah i mean because we team you know that's the whole reason we clean from the chamber side right is you know because the rifle could tolerate a right. little bit of 
damage there and we'd probably sure. never know. Sure. But you put that same little bit of damage at the crown and obviously so it's going to make a huge most. impact. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, I stand corrected. <laughs> A very um, sensitive part of the rifle, yeah. right? But you know, you, you imagine you're taking a um, a cleaning rod and dragging that across all the sensitive areas of your of your rifle and your bore. You're eventually going to cause some wear and some damage there if you're if you're not. So essentially, a bore guide is centering up that cleaning rod inside the bore, yeah. mm-hmm. um, so you're not scraping it across yeah. and across things. And I, I wouldn't recommend anything but a carbon fiber yes, or a plastic yeah, coated highly cleaning rod. Yeah. You know, for that emergency field use. You know, to get some mud out of the barrel or something, then yeah, the you know the cheap thread together aluminum one, yeah, I think is is all right. But I would, I cringe if I ever saw someone use like a sectionalized steel cleaning rod. Yeah, you know, I mean, those that's carbon just... those carbon tipped in rods are worth the investment for yeah, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. No. Yeah. No. Off on a tangent. Heck, heck, we could get real de- real detailed, but uh, jumping all the preparatory steps and what you're putting it in and the angle and all this stuff of how that rifle sits. Just talking about cleaning that bore, we start with carbon and we push a caliber specific um, nylon brush down and we are doing a, just saturating that brush with the carbon cleaner. Again, it's the KG, I forget what number KG it is. KG number one. KG one, one. one yeah. for carbon. Okay. And then uh, we do 20 strokes, just back and forth. Okay. And then we douse it again, 20 strokes again, and then we do it a third time. So we're getting 60 strokes in is what we're doing. And uh, because that carbon is just so stubborn, that's why we're, we're doing it that much. And we're resaturating that brush to really try and uh, break it up in there. Okay. Um, then we push it out with three to five dry patches. Just get all that crap out. Okay. And we like to teach to, you know, you're not going off of the color of the, of the patch, but more of a routine because you're trying to clean it the same every time. Okay, so three to five. So to me, I'm doing it with five patches. Okay, so 20, douse it, 20, douse it, 20, uh, clean, uh, and then push it out with five patches. Okay, then we jump over to the copper. And that is KG 12. 12, 12 okay. And uh, we same deal. Um, now, if we're using the same uh, rod, then it's a good idea to, now I'm going to take it and wipe that rod down so that you don't have any crap that's built up, uh, you know, through run that rod back and forth, maybe embedding itself into that rod, making an abrasive rod now. So we wipe that sucker down. Um, you can take carb cleaner and spray the nylon brush to get any, uh, that, um, KG two, is it one. two? One. KG one. Shiz. Uh, off of it first. Okay. Um, so now same deal. We're doing it with the copper, but instead of doing three sets of 20 strokes, we're doing just two. So it's nylon brush down uh saturate that brush with your copper solvent then 20 strokes saturate again 20 strokes and then you're pushing out with three to five dry patches again yeah i'm just going to interrupt real quick yeah. and say um you know it's important to note that the kg line of uh, copper solvents you know most people are used to thinking of ammonia based copper solvents where you got to let them sit and soak you know kg is different because it's motion activated you know so that's why we're scrubbing with it as opposed to just letting it sit for 10 minutes and, and with most of your traditional copper solvents you're getting a blue streak right yes. that's kind of what's showing you that the copper is oxidizing with this whatever the chemistry is that this kg product it, it comes out black but it man i tell you i've tried yeah, see it. i've tried the ammonia stuff this that that kg product is way way better um it, it kills that carbon or that copper really well i think it's better for us it, too. it's faster right yeah. that's why we started using yeah. it you know digress to production i mean that we, I couldn't clean enough rifles during the day when you You'd had to never be able put, to yeah. put a solvent in there and let it sit for 20 or 30 yeah. minutes before I could mm-hmm. come back to the rifle. So we had to find something. Uh, when KG first came out, it was actually when we first started looking at it, it was, uh, they used it to clean, uh, cannon oh, uh, really? bores on tanks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what it first came from. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, then they, they sent us some samples and some small bottles and then we started using it and then it caught on pretty quick after that. Yeah, that stuff um, works. So, yeah, so it works really well, um, especially on the copper side. Yeah. Maybe another aside, and maybe it's obvious, uh, you did mention a nylon brush rather than a brass brush. We we never, essentially never let a brass brush touch our bores, ideally, right? Yeah, I mean, maybe you just have to be so much more occasions. careful with yeah. them, right? You can't stop or hesitate in the bore or the bristles relax. And mm-hmm. then when you go again, forward again, it scratches that spot, right? Mm-hmm. And so... It, I would say never, you know, but 
if you run it all the way through at a consistent pace, all the way out, sure. and then pull it all the way back through at a consistent pace, you'd probably be okay. Yeah. Um, but they also give you, those brushes also give you a false positive yeah. on your ammonia-based stuff. Carbon, yeah. And so you'd, you'd always think that you were dirty in a dirty condition. So you'd over clean your bore with those. Um, so yeah, we don't use them because at, as, uh, Ian will say in the process here, we're going to work on some just little spots in the barrel that we, that we want to target, you know, some cleaning and mm -hmm. you can't do that with a brass brush yeah. with a, with a nylon brush. We can get in there and we can work one spot. And then you can reverse it. Yeah, we can brush. reverse anytime yeah. we want. Um, they don't last as long, right? Because we're yeah. we're you know we can stop and start in there, but they're cheap. I mean, four or five bucks for yeah. three or most, something like that. Uh, you, you clean they're pretty in hundred guns a week, maybe. But most guys at home are never going to yeah, wear they'll out. Never wear out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing on the brass brushes, and we probably never see it. You know, we probably never clean a hunting rifle enough to cause it. You know, but in the you know through eight world, you know, with the barrel lifes, you know. 8,000 rounds, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, um, you talk to some of the gunsmiths that build a lot of guns. And, um, you know, when the, when a gun comes back from a PD, like, Hey, this gun's not shooting anymore. Oftentimes they'd find that that crown was coned and that yeah. coning comes from pulling a bronze brush back yeah. through and it abrades that very sharp edge Where is that it? you get on the crown mm -hmm. and it just starts coning it a little bit. And since that's the last point of contact with the bullet, the accuracy just, it's gone, mm -hmm. you know? And then, so step one and troubleshooting why a gun wouldn't shoot was almost always, chopping half an inch off the barrel and recrowning it, you know, mm, based yeah. on that damage from either whether it was coming from Jags or whether it was coming from brass brushes. So I mean, I, I think also being careful with how you're handling that, that, uh, rod as you're doing, doing your, I mean, your 60 strokes or whatever yeah. with that brush is, you know, be careful. You're not dragging that, that Jag or brush too, too roughly across yeah. that ground. Yeah. Or, and, and the one, the way the Tiptons are designed is if you grab that handle as you're pushing it down, you know, that, that rod is actually twisting with, yeah. right? But inevitably, it, it doesn't always. And sure. so sometimes that nylon brush or the jag that you're pushing the patches through with comes unscrewed a little bit, and sure. then you go to pull it back through, and you just hear it knock that crown. Right. So I think, yeah, it's important just that, that you... Yeah. mindful of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, back to... Yeah, um, back to... Okay. <laughs> so we've got five steps here. There's more steps than that, but this is that meat of the cleaning the, mm -hmm. the bore, okay? So number one was that carbon two is copper and now we're getting into the bore shine which is you know this this is our routine cleaning and what we're doing with the bore shine is we're trying to prevent a uh, carbon ring okay and now there's a whole different process of, of busting that carbon ring out once you do have it uh, but this is the preventative you know kind of steps that we take so after you've done that uh, carbon copper now we're at the bore shine we again just take uh, that brush down the barrel and we're just hitting it with the kg bore shine which is what number, number? Two. Number, two. number two number two okay it's abrasive and uh we're just now we're working that first spot that jeremy's talking about where that carbon ring can kind of develop mm -hmm. so now with that nylon brush we can just kind of run it back and forth instead of dragging along the whole barrel we can, right in front of the chamber yep we're, just yep. work that spot um and we do 20 strokes okay then uh taking that out and we're going right to a carb cleaner. Okay. Like you're, I mean, I know there's, there's, um, actual gun scrubber type stuff. Yeah. Uh, that I think has some change in some of their chemicals that it's not supposed to uh, you want, like, hurt the, stocks the, and yeah. You want the non chlorinated and, stuff, right? Yeah. Just for safety purposes. Yeah. Well, and I just mean, for cost as well. Some of those, those labeled gun ones are like $15 a can as opposed to you can go to O'Reilly's or bumper to bumper and get a dollar a can for regular car yeah. cleaner too. So it's like, if you're going to use that as part of your process, you, you're going to use quite a bit of it. So you might as well just run the cheap stuff. Yeah. Just be more careful with it with on your stock and stuff. Yeah. So it, it will, I mean, car cleaner will take the paint off your stock. So, yeah. but, but it has a nice little nozzle and we've got a bore guide. You can easily spray it in there without getting it anywhere. And so you should be okay. So we've done carbon or carbon, copper, bore shine. Now we got the carb cleaner and we're just spraying it down and we, you know, we're spraying it down enough that we're starting to see it come out the muzzle end. Um, and that's just to, you know, flush out any of the debris and stuff. Yeah. In the there. grit, right? The we grit. put grit in there. We oh, want to get right. it out because we yeah. don't want to fire around with grit in there. Uh, you know, we don't want borlapping bullets. So we, we just want to yeah. get it out of there before we fire the mm -hmm. firearm. Okay. And then, uh, we take five dry patches and push everything out that way. Okay. And then it, optional is that oil, uh, patch of oil. If you're storing it, you know, mm. and, and if you don't have a dehumidifier in your safe or you're putting it in the basement or, 
or you just live in a more humid area, something like that. Right. But I think, and hit, you can hit it, Jeremy, with the um, why we do the carb cleaner, because that's kind of an interesting story there. Uh, well, you know, we started doing it in, in production because you know, to, to make things go a little faster, I would just use like a six, five Jag or, you know, on my seven millimeters and my 30, and I would just adjust the size of the patch. So I didn't have to swap Jags out all the time. I could just, I had three or four different sizes of patches depending on caliber. Yeah. Well, the problem with that is, is you can get a patch dimension on a sm smaller Jag that doesn't quite get the corners out of all your solvents. And so KG 12 is notorious for this. If you don't get it all out of your bore and you just set the rifle up, it will slowly just uh, work its way down to that chamber end. And when it dries, it is literally about as hard as carbon to get out. I mean, it just turns to rock. And then, of course, that changes the dimension of your uh, of your throat. And then what usually happens is you try to chamber around and it won't go forward enough to even close your bolt because the bullet sticks in that uh, copper solvent, the KG-12. Um, so we, we started running the... Um, carb cleaner in there just as a final flush to kind of get all that out of there. And we're doing the same thing. We want to do the same thing with our grit. We want to get the, the KG 12 out of there and we want to get that grit out of there because we don't want to do any damage to the barrel by leaving it in there. And so that, that's kind of why we do the carb cleaner at the end. Um, one thing on the, the uh, KG two, the grit, always remember to shake it up. Uh, yeah. It's suspended in oil, and um, I've seen a couple guys. They just turned it over and just squirted it on there. And I don't it's just think oil. Any, yeah, I don't yeah. think any grit came out, and they didn't. They it's didn't like clean ketchup it. before you shake it. Yeah, up. yeah. yeah. make sure you shake watery. it up and get that grit because it'll settle to the bottom of the bottle. Huh. And good so snow. make sure you get that shook up real good so that you're getting a nice uniform grit. You know, as you're mm -hmm. as you're doing it, and you should have no problems with it. Yeah. Is that a pumice grit, or I assume it's relatively soft, so it's not really doing any. I don't know. I'd have to read that. I'm not sure what the actual material they use. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're bypassing some of the setup and everything, right? Sure. To, to get your rifle set up to clean it. But since we're talking about that carb cleaner, I think we should hit that to cover your lenses. Just you're it's spraying cool. stuff. There's particles yeah. in the air or whatever, you know, I, cover your lenses when you're cleaning. So yeah. you don't get your coatings, you know, eaten away. Right. And then obviously, you know, as with all cleaning, you know, the rifle's set up so the barrels slope downhill. You know, so that carb cleaner all runs out the end of the barrel and it doesn't want to run back into your bedding and your trigger assembly, mm -hmm. et cetera. Makes sense. Yeah. And we're going to do a video, yeah. uh, at least one or two videos on this as well. Starring so, Jeremy. Yeah. So they'll, uh, <laughs> got so, a couple so old ones, have but some... it's about time for, for a refresh. Some, yeah. yeah. Those are, you've got yeah. a couple more years on you since those last <laughs> they ones. They might not recognize them. <laughs> probably won't. It's been about, that's probably 10 been years. 10 years. Yeah. That's really, yeah, yeah. maybe close. But, uh, yeah, so we plan on doing that as well. So if you need, like, if you're a visual guy like myself, you want to you'd be able to watch the process and kind of see what we're using visually. Maybe a little bit more detail. Yeah, a little more detail in there. Specifics. I'll show you the, the bore guides and things yeah. like that, yeah. um, you know, uh, on the video series. So just kind of keep watching for that as well. Should yeah, come yeah. out pretty soon too. I, I think the takeaway too is is everyone's intimidated to clean their barrel because they don't want to mess it up. Sure. But once you know the steps to do it, it's – it takes, it's not long. Yeah. And then you, you can, well, you just know how not to hurt it. Right. And yeah. so if you follow these steps and, and watch the video and stuff, you'll realize, heck, this is, this is not hard and it's not as scary as, as I think it is. Um, and hopefully that makes you, you know, take care of your rifle better. Yeah. And that probably limit the calls to our help desk too, because yeah. you know Jeremy knows very well, you know, a lot of the rifles that come back, you know, cause they're not shooting or something's going on with them. Ultimately, the problem ends up being they're just excessively fouled. Yeah. Good, good cleaning yeah. and it's as good as new. Huh? Yeah. 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 And lots of carbon rings. We see that a lot, you know, especially in those six fives. They, they tend to build a carbon ring. You know, it used to be the six five two eighty four used to be the one that really gave us fits there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, any six five will do it just a little faster than the rest. So all you six five guys out there, keep an eye on it. Run that, uh, run that KG2 as part of your process and you shouldn't have any problems at all with it. How Especially about, suppressors, suppressor yeah. guys. How about uh, like round count and when you should clean? And I like that sixty. That sixty yeah. is a good number. I, yeah. It gives you. You might be over cleaning the the little stuff like your creed mores and stuff, but you tend to shoot those a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So maybe it wouldn't hurt to, you know, over clean it just a little bit. But, yeah. You know, you think yeah. about it. For a lot of guys, you know, obviously we encourage guys to shoot, not just because we'll say we can yeah. sell you ammo, but you know, you, you shoot for more, you. you shoot more, you're going to be a better shot. But, you know, for a lot of guys that are shooting a couple boxes a year, 
you clean at the beginning of the year, put a couple of flowers down there, you're basically shots, say six through 60 are good to go probably for the, for the rest of the year. Yeah. Oh, depending. easy. You know, technically I, I, I would probably not clean my rifle for three years if yeah. I did the the round count. Right. Yeah. But you get into that January time frame and you're bored and sure. you know, you know, it's a good time to, yeah. to <laughs> spring, you, get it, you know, spring, get it ready. You know, you're starting you're to get antsy. Up. You yeah. want to get, get, get out and hunt. So but in reality, the yeah, the, the, the 60, ready. the 60 number on your hunting rifle might yeah. not be every, it might be every couple of years, you know? Sure. So it's good to have a process. You can just go knock that process out really quick. Yeah. Go to the range, shoot a couple of fowlers, make sure everything's okay. And you're, ready to roll for another yeah. year or two. And this is all assuming that they have a 6.5 creep more to practice on steel and shoot coyotes. Well, with. Yeah. like yeah. I said, we definitely recommend yeah. they do some more shooting, but yeah. you know, we know the reality is that a lot of, a lot yeah. of rifles just don't get a lot of rounds. Yeah. It's yeah. They're, no, they're there for to plot for hunting season. You and know? that's really perfect. I mean, your, your actual big game hunting rifle, you know, we try to keep the round count down on that. Yeah. You know, just shoot it enough to be familiar with it and, you know, make sure it's tracking and stuff, but do the lion's share of your practice, you know, with something that doesn't encourage flinching and, doesn't burn barrels so fast and it's yeah. a little bit cheaper to shoot. Well, we might as well throw in a little shameless plug in the Nexus then. Um, you <laughs> there know, you go. Here yeah. coming in the future, we've got uh, switchable bolt heads. So you could run a Creedmoor, yep. Creedmoor barrel and shoot that thing all, all, summer, all summer, all all winter and throw your uh, Magnum bolt face back on through a 28 barrel back on it and I shouldn't have said caliber. Actually, actually, Sorry, Aaron. Yeah, 300 PRC. 300 PRC. Yeah. 300 PRC for now. <laughs> we, don't, then, we, don't have a creed, we don't have a 6.5 Creedmoor barrel yet, but we'll keep putting yeah. the pressure on Aaron and see if we can yeah. get that one sooner. Yeah, I, I, I think having that trainer barrel would be, it is an oh, absolute, yeah. Yeah, it'd be fun, absolute I think. win. Yeah. yeah. Well, it just, it goes so well with that, yeah. that purpose of that system, right? Well, I just look be at, able to, yeah. you know, have a trainer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just look at, I've got, you know, the, the 6.5 PRC and the 20 nozzle that have been mm. running for years and it's like. I've had that 28 nozzle for twice as long, and it's probably got a tenth as many rounds to it as that 6.5 yeah. PRC. Yeah. Yeah. 6.5 is just so much more fun to shoot, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, sometimes you need the the big boy for yeah some, some big game and some big long shots. But. And if you're someone like Mitch, you know, it might be the other way around. It's true. He puts <laughs> a lot of rounds to that 28. Yeah. Yeah. I, think he's, I think he's just about worn he out does. that 28 barrel he already. Does, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. How about don'ts maybe with cleaning? I mean, it's a good I'd, point, you know. I'd say the biggest don't, and I, I mentioned it earlier, is don't use that military surplus cleaning rod. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that jointed steel rod, you know, those jagged edges. You know, when you apply, when you put a tight pit, fit and patch on one, the end of one rod, and yeah. then you, if I was just to squeeze the two together with a cleaning rod between my fists with no barrel, it's going to bow. Yeah. Well, the barrel keeps it from bowing. And what that means is that there's jagged edges scraping down inside your barrel there. Yeah. You know, so that, that would definitely be a don't and then uh that probably brings us right to my second least favorite cleaning implement and ian's got a good story about this which is the old uh boar snake yeah boar snake so shout out to my cousin tim again i always use him as an example with this but usually it's a good example yeah <laughs> <laughs> um you know you learn by you know this stuff happening but um it, just your regular old boar snake that you get from shields or something you know or, or whatever i'm not hitting on shields but but uh, basically, you drop it down, right? And it's got that little weighted end. Mm -hmm. And you grab it and you pull it through. And and um, he pulled and it got to where it got real tight, about halfway down the barrel, something like that. And and he couldn't pull it anymore, pull it more. And he was pulling so hard. It's like Chinese finger trap. You know, it's braided. So it brought the back end as far to the front end as it could. Uh -huh. So it just sucked it all in real tight. And he kept pulling until it snapped. And now he's got oh, nothing in there uh, to, to pull this thing anyway. So he calls me and I was like, man, let's, okay, first off, let's just be really careful and try and push it out the other end. Yeah. And that didn't work. So we're like, all right, let's pour some solvents down there, let it soak overnight. That probably and just, just makes it swell. Do, right? I don't know, but <laughs> it didn't work. And we're like, we got three options. We could, uh, Put some gasoline down there and light a match. <laughs> that option. That's my vote. Yeah. <laughs> Two, we could try and shoot it out. We're like, that's probably not <laughs> good that. either. Probably slightly worse. <laughs> <laughs> or three, we could bring it to a gunsmith and see what he says, you know, and bring it to the first gunsmith and and he, you know, tries some of the same stuff we were doing and he tries something with like a, a barb on it to get a hold uh -huh. of it, to pull it. And basically by the end of it, he said, here's it back. Here's a phone number to a guns another gunsmith. And I hope I didn't scrape your barrel up too much. <laughs> so different gunsmith, and they actually like bored that thing out of there, like 
had to literally like what put it on a lathe and blow that thing out and uh it shoots phenomenal luckily Mm. but uh you know that was the horror story now that doesn't happen every dang time but but there's that and then to go on not as extreme level is a lot of them have like the brass bristles on them something Mm. like halfway down the the braid or something right and when you're pulling one of those boar snakes you're not pulling straight out the end you're off to the side of the rifle so inevitably you know you're pulling and it's going to be scraping the one end one end one end and if you're doing it enough times throughout the years hmm. like brian was kind of talking about you might start creating a little bevel right there or something yeah. and, and having um not symmetrical gas escape right mm-hmm. so yeah. so anyway yeah that's keep those for your shotguns and your pistols but yeah. not your precision rifle yeah you know and then i mean the whole concept of the boar snake is this it's light and it's easy to carry you yeah. know but if you need something in the field because it does you no good if you plug your barrel up with mud, you yeah. know, because you need yeah. something that's an actual you need rod. need to push through. Yeah, nothing. you can push through. Yeah. You know, and, it's, it's, and I'm pretty sure we're talking about, I think, completely independently, completely different backgrounds. Me and Jeremy both ended up with the same solution. Yeah. And it's that rapid, rapid rod. rod. Yeah, which yeah. is basically, uh, it's like uh, sections of an aluminum cleaning rod that are assembled with on a piece cable of cable board through the middle. with a yeah. threaded back Smart. end to it. You know, so you basically, yeah. as you thread it, it applies enough tension that it joins everything together and turns what folds up into about, you know, hmm. know four inches long. Yeah, and, four, four or five you know, just a little long. pouch, you know, turns into a, you know, 20 some inch cleaning rod that has enough rigidity to it that you can push something out the barrel. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't use it for routine cleaning, but no. for that emergency field use, it's perfect. I've never bothered carrying one. I remember you showing me yours at uh, bear hunting last yeah. year. It's a good idea. Mm-hmm. I might need to pick one up. Yeah, I keep mine just in camp. Just, yeah. you know, just in case. try not to carry it with me because I, I tend to carry too much stuff as it is. So yeah. <laughs> I carry too much stuff. But, yeah. That's, that way I don't forget it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think a big don't for me is um, when you clean without the bore guide. Yeah. So the bore guide is so important because it keeps the solvents out of your, um, out of your mag box. And so it affects your feeding. You start mm-hmm. gumming that up. Mm-hmm. And then the even more important, important one is your trigger group. You start, you know, you're pulling that rod right back across the top there and any of those solvents that get in there, we've already talked about how it can actually impede a bullet from going into the chamber. We'll think what that'll do to your nice, fine little trigger. When we used to run those jewels, they were notoriously mm-hmm. sensitive to dirt mm-hmm. and stuff. And we, we would see a lot of guys, they just wanted to do it really quick. So they wouldn't, they just, oh, I'll just make sure I don't rub it on anything. Yeah. Nine yeah, times out of 10, they drip something in there and that trigger would fail, you know, by not, uh, not engaging the sear. So yeah, the boar guide to me is like, that's a must seeing mm-hmm. guys not doing that really yeah no really you know, is a no-no it's not an issue with our rifles or rifles that have kind of a modern bedding system but you know a lot of really high quality gunsmith build guns from years past there's still some doing it you know they have a glass bedding job inside there you know and without that bore guide you get solvent in there that deteriorates that glass bedding mm-hmm. that's a good point you know and that was always one of the main reasons we used the bore guide you know mm. in my marine corps days you know because those rifles were still glass bedded yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it was on the same lines. Don't forget your bore guide. That's yeah. probably my number one. And I think my other one was is don't don't overclean. And and that's not just frequency, but you don't have to get every last tiny speck of black out of that bore typically, right? Yeah. And it, it's nice moving from, you know, as I've matured in life, um, going from shooting cheap factory guns to custom a, a custom cut rifled barrel is a world of difference trying to clean versus a, a cheap factory barrel. Um, you, you'll, you, you could spend your entire life cleaning a, a factory barrel and never, never. get it <laughs> because it's got so many little grooves and yep. imperfections that some of them shoot great, but you'll see all the chatter marks inside that barrel. If you run a bore scope through there, it, it holds so much grit. You'll never, never get all of it out. Yeah. But you know, you, you're going, once you get your, your bore clean, you're going to go back and foul it anyway. You don't want to be shooting off of a, a clean barrel. And so don't worry about every last little bit. Clean it enough to where it's going to get to where you need to go and then mm. foul it back up and yep. get to shoot. That's where the process is. Don't nice, waste your right? time. Yeah. Just run the process. You yeah. know, you've got it good enough yeah. to make it return to its shootable condition and, and then just go have fun. Yeah. 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 I think the last don't, it just, a memory came up from back in the rain days. I like your, I like Ian's stories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Brian was an instructor at cyber school, so he would just, he's going to cringe with us, but, but it wasn't our precision rifles. It was our M4s. Okay. We'd come back from, 
you know, whatever field op that we did in training and you're just, you know, you're riding back in these seven tons and you're just completely caked in, in dust. And if you're, you have a buddy that's in the military, you were in the military, you know that the armorers were notorious for returning your rifle back to you, not letting you put it in the armory until it was spec and, you know, spec and span perfectly clean. So instead of sitting there with, you know, whatever bull crap we had, cotton swabs and whatever to get all the dust and everything that were caked on, we would just take those rifles in the shower with us. <laughs> <laughs> just wash the whole damn thing like we we're watching our bodies. Then, <laughs> then, you know, then we could get it turned in pretty, pretty quickly. <laughs> Not on your precision rifles, bad idea. Yeah, I mean, my, my kind of similar story was, you know, going way back to when I was in the police academy, we issued Glocks, you know, those things that get the white glove treatment, you know, after every range day, so... We put them in the dishwasher. <laughs> Dish soap does a really good job of cutting garbage. Nice. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, they don't call them Tupperware for heat. nothing. Yeah, good. yeah. yeah. The Glocks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's funny. Good to know. All right. Well, I think we covered that one, guys. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. the time. And uh, yeah, definitely look look out for uh, Jeremy's video series here coming up. Uh, hit us up with any questions. I'm sure there's some things that we missed or glossed over if you want any clarification. And uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. If you like what you're hearing here, please take a second and give us a five-star rating and a positive review on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. We appreciate your feedback and suggestions for topics you'd like discussed or questions you want answered on the podcast. You can reach out on Facebook or Instagram or send us an email to podcast at gunworks.com. Also, be sure and check out our full offering of long-range gear at gunworks.com. Use promo code LRP for free shipping on any order.